Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Long COVID Clinic, What You Can Do, the fireside chat series with me, Dr. Benita Kane, and Helen Oakley, patient, advocate, and founding member of Long COVID Support, which is our partner charity. Now, unfortunately, Helen can't join us uh, live tonight, but sending you lots of love, Helen. Uh, in this series, I've got some fantastic guests lined up who are either treating patients with long COVID or innovating in this space. The session's live and interactive, so please get involved by posting your questions in the chat. And if you're going to struggle to stay on for the whole thing, don't worry, it is being recorded and it's going to be available on our YouTube channel at LCCWYCD straight afterwards. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce my guest for tonight. Um, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, genuinely one of my favorite people and feel really privileged to know you. Uh, Sanjay is a consultant cardiologist in York. Uh, he has an he's had an interest in POT long before the pandemic kicked off and has become somewhat busier since uh, 2020 and now has over 2000 patients on his caseload with the condition. So welcome Sanjay. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real privilege. And I know you're still in the hospital, and so we're really like keeping everything crossed that the the Wi-Fi is okay and it doesn't it doesn't cut out. So um, I'm just warning everyone in advance. Um, so uh, we actually go back quite a long way, don't we? And we've reconnected over the last couple of years. But we we well, I'll let you I'll let you explain. Yeah, we met in about I think it was around about 2002. And uh, yeah. we were both junior doctors at that time, and I used to do cardiology. I think you were doing respiratory or respiratory medicine, yeah. and maybe care. And uh, I, I always remember that you had the best handwriting ever. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't write edit anymore, so yeah. it's uh, but yeah, no. And it was it was lovely to reconnect. I wish it was under better circumstances, but it's been over obviously um, our interest in, in this condition. So why don't we get straight into it? Because we, have, we are time limited and we've got absolutely tons to cover. Um, so what I thought, we have actually recorded something for the channel, which will hopefully be coming out um, as, as a piece in the next few months, which is really all about what is POTS? How do we diagnose it? What are the symptoms? So I wanted to focus less on that today and much more on the treatments and the very practical things about what we can do. But I think just as an introduction, are you able to sort of explain what does POT stand for and just give us a brief overview of what the condition is? Yeah, thank you. So POT uh, stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. This is a condition which is characterized by a constellation of symptoms uh, which tend to be more noticeable or more bothersome to the patient when the patient is standing up, particularly for a prolonged period of time. So the patient will often describe symptoms of, I don't like being stood for a prolonged period of time because my heart rate goes up excessively. My legs turn to jelly. Um, I have a headache. I feel like I'm going to pass out. I get visual disturbance and almost like I'm going to black out. Uh, so those patients... Um, you know, historically, even before COVID, there were patients who would present with that constellation of symptoms said uh, doctors. And unfortunately, they would go to different doctors, but when they turned up to a cardiologist, what the cardiologist would say is, oh gosh, you know, you're saying your heart rate goes up when you stand up, let's measure it. Let's measure your heart rate when you're lying down, let's get you to stand up and see. And lo and behold, they would find that these people would have a very exaggerated rise in heart rate. So usually, you know, I've done it myself and my heart rate would go up by about 10 or 15. These people, more than 30, generally 40, 50 beats per minute. Um, so those patients got given this term, this diagnosis of POTS. Uh, when you think about it, however, uh, this is perhaps not a complete diagnosis because when you talk to these patients, they will say, actually, I feel rubbish all the time. It's got, you know, it's not that I feel great when I'm lying down uh, and I feel awful when I'm standing up. I feel awful all the time, but I definitely feel more awful when I stand up. And so they'll describe other symptoms like brain fog, uh, temperature dysregulation, lack of refreshing sleep, severe fatigue, uh, gut issues, etc. So when you start thinking about it, you say, well, okay, 
this term POS doesn't capture the whole constellation of their symptomatology, and perhaps it is better thought of as a dysautonomia, an imbalance between the flight and fight responses and the rest and digest responses. These people are more in flight and fight mode and less in rest and digest mode. They will say, we are always simultaneously tired and wired. So now when you look back, you say, okay, dysautonomias, how do they come about? And what we know is that some people can get a virus like glandular fever in the old days, and something would change. They would get this virus and they would be unwell for a few days, and then they were never quite the same. So post-viral dysautonomias are things we've known about, entities we've known about for a long time. Now along comes a virus which infects so many people in such a short space of time, like COVID. And many people have started uh, complaining of the same symptoms that we've seen with other post-viral dysautonomias. And so I truly believe that a significant proportion of patients with long COVID probably have a post-viral dysautonomia. And it's important that people bear that in mind because we can manage some post-viral dysautonomias. And if you think of COVID, long COVID, at least in some patients as a post-viral dysautonomia, maybe they respond to the same treatments that we've given other patients with post-viral dysautonomias. And that is where I come in. Yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna unpick some of that a little bit because I think this is gonna be important when we talk about the treatments. So I remember watching a video that you did online, um, which described um, where well, you you had a you had a water bottle, and I thought it was a really oh, nice. Oh, you've oh, brilliant! I, I didn't even check. No, we can't see it very well because the background so you might just hold it sort of yeah. So the water bottle, if you use that as the analogy of the body, I thought that was such a simple way to explain it because people might not understand what dysautonomia means. Can you can you just do that very quickly so we can um, yeah. understand the mechanisms? So the idea is that when you're trying to appreciate what happens, because the fundamental thing is these people say we are worse when we're upright. So we have to understand what happens when we become upright to understand what may be going wrong in these people. So if you think of the human body as this is the brain and this is the body and the, the water is the blood, when you're lying flat, because there's no gravity acting in the equation, uh, blood will get to the brain. When you stand the bottle up like this, the blood gets sucked down and the brain does not get the blood. And therefore, most people would end up collapsing because of the lack of blood. However, we're equipped with a couple of reflexes that come into action to try and prevent that happening. So when you stand up, what will happen is our blood vessels will detect this surge of blood into, um, into our uh, feet and our blood vessels will constrict, gosh, this is like magic, and will constrict pushing more blood up to, to the brain. And then we produce adrenaline and the adrenaline makes the heart beat faster and push more blood up to the brain. And those are the compensatory mechanisms that come into action that allow us to stay upright. Somewhere in patients with POTS, that doesn't happen. Now, it may well be that they don't squeeze as well, or it may be that they're not responding with the adrenaline and they're overproducing adrenaline. And when they overproduce adrenaline, their heart rate goes up excessively fast. Of course, when the heart becomes very fast, it becomes less efficient because it's not getting time to fill with blood. So your heart rate has gone up, but it's not causing a commensurate increase in the amount of blood that's going around. And that may be the mechanism. So, we work on that hypothesis, and a lot of our treatments are based around that. But as I say, perhaps the situation is a little bit more complex in that there's this dysautonomia going on, which is not only affecting our adrenaline levels when we stand up, but our adrenaline levels at all times. So if we're asleep at night and we have a nightmare, maybe we're producing so much adrenaline that we end up waking up, not knowing what, that we've woken up, going back to sleep. And in the morning, we feel like, we haven't slept at all. And then you're exhausted. And when you're exhausted, then everything gets much worse. So that's probably the mechanism. Well, that's the working hypothesis that I have used in my patients. And, and that's, of course, why patients describe um, their feet will go purple, uh, their hands mm. go purple, they feel dizzy. So it just I, I just thought that water bottle um, analogy is really good. And I, I steal it and I use that for my patients as well. Um, 
And just briefly about the autonomic nervous system. So this is the nervous system which controls all of our automatic body functions from breathing to heart rate to blood pressure to digestion. It's the most unappreciated bit of medicine because we don't really focus on it much at all, do we, in medicine? Um, but it's really, really important in any sort of chronic illness. And as you mentioned, it's divided into what we call sympathetic or fight or flight and parasympathetic, which is rest and digest. And like everything in the body, we want this to be in balance. Um, and in POTS, it very much gets tipped into that sympathetic overdrive. And we'll come back to that because that's going to be important with the treatments. So I think in terms of just very quickly touching on definitions, a lot of patients will have these symptoms. They'll go and see their doctor. The doctor will do the standing test. And if they don't hit this cutoff of 30 beats a minute when they stand up, like the heart rate has to go up by 30, they'll say, no, you haven't got POTS off you go. Is that too simplistic? And um, well, let's talk about that as a definition. Like, where did that come from? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, I think it is too simplistic, because uh, the first thing is, it's a man made definition. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing so much more now, we are also beginning to appreciate a few things. Number one, symptoms can vary. So patients may find that one day they're doing really well, other days, they're really down. Uh, particularly patients tolerate dehydration uh, very badly. So first thing in the morning, they get much worse. If they're going down to see their GP in the afternoon, by that time they've hydrated, they've tried to fill that bottle up. So you may not necessarily get the same heart rate rise. Um, so I, I think it's a spectrum. I think that it doesn't mean that if your heart rate only goes up by 29, uh, you don't have the condition. I think you have to listen to the patient. If the patient is describing a long-standing constellation of enfeebling symptoms such as uh, orthostatic intolerance, heart rate going up, brain fog, lack of refreshing sleep, temperature dysregulation. If they have a history of going and seeing multiple specialists and nothing positive being found, if they've just been left to it with no good diagnosis or good treatment, then I think it's worth treating them for POTS and seeing what happens. Because to my mind, that is the best way of knowing whether someone has a condition or not. Treat them and see if they get better. Uh, and I have done this in my practice, and I would say 50% of my patients who have gotten better with treatment had a negative tilt test, had a negative stand test, you know, and had I not just gone and listened to the patient and wanted to just help the patient rather than relying on the test, uh, I would have missed an opportunity to serve these people. So I would not let a negative test dissuade anyone. At the end of the day, you work with the patient. What is the patient telling us? And if it sounds like it, go for it. Treat it. Treatment is not risky. And the patient will give you almost immediate feedback and say, oh, actually, when you do this, I feel much better. Great. Yeah. So we shouldn't be kind of tied to these very stringent cutoffs. We've got to listen to the patient. We've got to listen yeah. to the history. And uh, and of course, I've read that um, even in the morning, your your you know your lean test or your stun test might be different to how it is in the evening. It can vary day to day, it can vary week to week. And you know, there's nothing linear about this condition at all. So that's really good advice. Okay, conscious of time. So let's move on to um, the basics of treatment. So we'll start with the non-pharmacological or the non-drug treatment, and then we'll move on to the drug treatment. So basics are things like fluid and salt. So what are the recommendations that you that you have for that? Yeah, so the idea is that if we're gonna use this bottle model, what you want to do in an ideal world is either fill the bottle up with more or make the bottle smaller in some way, right? That Those are the principles. So how do you fill the bottle up? Well, more water, so clear water, uh, three liters, four liters of water is fine on a daily basis. Uh, and along with drinking more, you want to avoid things that dehydrate you. So you want to avoid soda, you want to avoid co coffee, etc. But three to four liters of clear water is good. The problem with a lot of these patients is the more they drink, the more they urinate out. So you want something to hold the water in their bodies, not let them lose it. And in that sense, electrolytes and salt are exceptionally helpful. So, and they do need a ton of salt. So 
six to 10 grams of salt, which equates to two teaspoonfuls of extra salt every day, which can be a little bit more difficult to take. And therefore they can either do it through table salt or they can take salt tablets, slow salt tablets. And each slow salt tablet is about 600 milligrams. So we normally say start off with 10 tablets a day. And that would be the kind of salt intake that you need with water. A lot of people drink more water, but they do not increase the salt and therefore they do not gain the benefit. You must increase the salt um, and, and, and electrolytes. Salt, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I was going to say the salt essentially helps pull that fluid into the vascular, into the blood vessels to yes. help. So, the, so then the body has less work to do to push that column of Absolutely. blood up. So that's really important, isn't it? And just in terms of, so practically, um, is it okay just to go straight on to six to 10 grams? Because people go, oh my gosh, so, you know, we've had it drummed into us for so many years that salt is bad, it'll put your blood pressure up. I'm also seeing people who two, three years down the line of long COVID now have got good going, high blood pressure, got hypertension. So how do we balance that messaging? Well, you know, the first thing I would say is that the... Um, a lot of the patients who have uh, POT symptoms tend to run a low blood pressure historically. If you ask them, they say, my blood pressure always runs low or I've always had low blood pressure. That's the first thing. Salt increases your blood pressure. Great. If your blood pressure is low and you want to increase it, give them some salt. You know, you shouldn't worry about high blood pressure when you're wanting treatment for low blood pressure. That's the first thing. The second thing to say is that the risks of salt are if your kidneys don't work, you know, so if you've got kidney disease, if you've got something like that, then I think you should be careful. But if you are a young, otherwise healthy person, your kidneys should handle the salt quite well. The third thing to say is that the risks of hypertension are in the long run, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying try some salt. And if you find that after two weeks of having more salt, you feel great and you're starting to walk around, well, we've cracked it, right? That's where you want it to be. You yeah, want quality so of care. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, and and uh, by, if, if we have to be brave enough to try stuff, because the problem a lot of POTS patients find is that no one's willing to try. This is not a condition that fits nicely in a nice box which has guidelines and protocols around it. This is a bunch of people who have been left out in the wilderness because they don't fit in a nicely defined box, you know. And so if we're going to listen to patients, then we have to be brave enough to try the things that we think may work. And then we have to take their feedback and decide whether it's worth trying it on another on patient. That's how we've got to do it in the absence of... Yeah big multi-center study. So I've done that. I've told people, have salt. I've been doing this for 10 years. Hardly anyone comes back to me and says, oh my God, Dr. Gupta, you've given me terrible hypertension and as a result, I've had a stroke or anything. Most of them say, you know, I tried the salt. I think it does make a difference. I said, great, keep going. And then if I want to know about the blood pressure, if I want to know about the blood pressure, I do a 24 hour blood pressure monitor, give them an average and work with that. The problem is that a lot of these people overproduce adrenaline. So adrenaline will transiently push your blood pressure up. So when they stand up, they'll say, oh, my blood pressure is really high. But that's because of all this adrenaline. It's not that they have a harmful process going on in their body. You know, is blood pressure a number or is blood pressure a harmful process going on? That's the important question. And yeah. so I yeah. personally don't worry about numbers. What I want to know is, is there a harmful process? If there is, I'll be careful. If there isn't, Am I making the patient feel better? Because that's the whole yeah. aim, isn't it? Okay. And then um, just in terms of the type of salts, there's a few questions coming in. Um, is, is there a recommendation of the type of salt? And also when we talk about electrolytes, some of the some of the um, formulations have, for example, like diorolite have sugar in. And so people are then taking, you know, three, four, five sachets a day or however much. Um, that's quite a lot of additional sugar. Uh, so should we be looking at electrolytes without the sugar? What's the what's the thought? Or are we just better off sticking to salt tablets? I mean, I think a lot of people struggle to get as much salt as is needed. So electrolytes do help. It's an additional way of adding more salt in. And it's also an additional way of uh, correcting sort of subclinical electrolyte deficiencies. Uh, in terms of electrolytes, uh, most of my patients take like diarolite two sachets a day. 
um, but you can make your own electrolytes um, and uh, the, there's some amino acid based electrolytes which apparently seem to work as well. So I don't have any particular preference. The intention is that you are supplementing and you're supplementing with some salt and some potassium and some magnesium, etc. Um, so, yeah, okay. Yeah. So there's there's no specific brand or anything like that. So I so a lot of my patients use the Science in Sport brand, but it's quite expensive. So there are cheaper um, alternatives available, but um, they are diff they've got different flavors. So they can just be a bit more palatable in terms of um, of things. Okay, so um, let's move on then. So compression um, is another treatment. So can you just talk a little bit about that? About compression. Yeah. Yeah, so compression, I mean, the whole idea with compression is that you're squeezing the bottle. Um, and so the more you can squeeze it, the better. And the higher up you can squeeze it, the better, right? So if you were trying to squeeze the bottle and you squeeze it just there, for sorry, just there, you're not going to get as much of an effect as if you squeeze it up to there and up to there. So uh, when you're wearing compression garments, you want to get something as high up as possible. You know, it has to extend from the bottom all the way. Yeah, up. and we're talking about so you can get compression socks or tights or stockings, and they can be below the knee or above the knee. And then you can get the abdominal bands as yeah. well, can't you? Now, people will sometimes say, "Well, where do I get these things from?" Because they can be made to measure, can't they? But um, they can be prescribed. They can be bought. Is there any sort of guidance on where you get good compression garments? Because they're, they're not very nice to wear. I mean, if we're honest, but that. They, they are um, very helpful, aren't they? They can be very helpful. Um, you want something that exerts about 30 to 40 millimeters of inward pressure. So RALS class two or RALS class three uh, compression stockings. Uh, that's the kind of standard RALS standard. Um, the second thing to say is that the best place to get measured out is at a local lymphedema clinic, wherever possible, because that's what they do. They measure you out properly. Some of the uh, manufacturers offer a measuring out service. Uh, so, and I think there are some places where there's considerable expertise. So there's a place in Leeds where there's a lot of expertise on how you measure patients out. Uh, but I agree. I think before just investing in compression stockings, you have to feel comfortable that that stocking is going to work for you. And you want to get something which goes above the knee, ideally has a waist attachment as well. Yeah, okay. So best to get the sort of made to measure through a proper service rather than just buying something off Amazon or, you know, other providers. Okay. And then um, some of the other sort of lifestyle type things that people need to think about. So anything to improve the pump of the lower limbs. So we do talk about exercise, which is, of course, a little bit controversial in long COVID and MECFS because it's a balance, isn't it, between building the muscles up but not triggering what we call PEM or post-exertional malaise which is a real hallmark of these fatiguing illnesses so um it's quite difficult to, to to advise sometimes what the right thing to do is so what 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 do you generally advise well I'm and and you're quite right because uh, the first thing is I mean I don't have as much insight in chronic fatigue syndrome but this is something that is mentioned to me by those patients and so I do listen to them and the first thing I would say is deconditioning is always a bad thing. Deconditioning is a bad thing. So you want to avoid being deconditioned wherever possible, regardless of what you have. In POTS, what you can do is you can do exercises which don't require you to be stood up. Uh, so because patients generally feel a bit better when they're lying down, trying to do recumbent exercises. And those don't have to be intense exercises. They don't have to be long drawn out exercises but they need to be consistent, you know, so you want to be doing simple things like squeezing a pillow with your legs every day, or if you have a bike, a recumbent bike, doing five minutes on that. A lot of problems arise when a patient will say, look, yesterday was a good day and I really needed to get fit, so I went for a one-mile run because I was having a good day. And then the problem is that then they're laid out with their PEM for two weeks afterwards. So I say to them that the, all the benefit you may have gained from doing that one mile run has been wiped out by two weeks of deconditioning. So much better to do something very small, but do do something. 
uh, and to try and keep those muscles active. And uh, doing a little bit every day uh, and ideally doing it in a recumbent position and then slowly building up. It can take three, four, five months, you know, of just building up painfully slowly uh, to try and get to that position where you can do some exercise when you're upright without necessarily triggering off uh, weeks of PEM. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do really want to get onto the drug treatment. So just very quickly, some of the other things like tilting the bed, meals, magnesium, yeah. sleep. Are you able to just like rattle through kind of some of the other advice? I think absolutely. Diet is important, really important. A, a low carb diet, a more ketogenic diet is good. A low histamine anti-inflammatory diet is lots of what lots of patients seem to benefit from. So small meals, big meals, pool more blood to the gut. Small meals are better. Number two, taking a magnesium supplement can be very helpful for a lot of people. And magnesium is poorly measured and there's a lot of subclinical magnesium deficiency and that can, correcting the magnesium can be very helpful. Don't worry about the blood test, just take the supplement. Uh, number three, sleep is hugely important. Uh, very difficult to know how to address sleep. But again, sleep hygiene, making sure you're sleeping at the same time every day. And patients with POTS dysautonomia, because they're so hyper adrenergic, they're so sensitive, sympathetically stimulated, you want to avoid arguments, big long discussions, uh, looking up stuff online, all those things you want to avoid when it comes to sleeping. You want to push all that out and have a little ritual, keep everything covers, you know, black curtains, uh, minimal sound, and get some sleep. Self-care is so, so incredibly important when it comes to lifestyle changes. Other things that may help, um, uh, diet, small, uh, my, yeah, small dose of melatonin sometimes can help with yeah. sleep, I find with my patients. And with yeah. regards to magnesium, because there's lots of different types of magnesium supplements, is there any specific one type of magnesium yeah. that you recommend? So I recommend magnesium taurate, 125 milligrams twice a day, because uh, the commonly prepared magnesium, common magnesium preparations contain oxide, magnesium oxide, and oxide just goes straight through you. So you only get like 4% of what you're taking in. Taking something like taurate or citrate or something like that holds it in the stomach a lot longer, and therefore you get more absorption. Lovely. And what about sort of tilting the, the head of the bed up? Does that help people or is that, did I invent that? No. So some people say that that helps. Uh, it takes a while to help. The idea, there are two ways it helps. One is that when you tilt the bed and your feet are lower than your head is, then uh, more blood goes to your uh, legs. And because more blood's going to your legs, less blood goes to the kidneys, right? Because some blood is going to the legs and staying there. And therefore the kidneys produce less urine. So we are, when you wake up in the morning, you don't, you're not as dehydrated as if you're lying flat. That's one thing. And the second thing is obviously having more blood go down to your legs means that your lugs may be use, you're sort of maybe using more leg muscle to try and keep things going, keep the circulation going. So that's another reason. The reality is with POTS, if you ask me, lifestyle changes are very worthwhile, but they don't make huge improvements in the patient's condition. Most patients yeah. do need medications that you're going to come down to. Okay, so that brings us really nicely onto the drug. So one of the cornerstones of treating POTS is controlling that inappropriate rise in the heart rate. Um, and the types of drugs we, well, we can use beta blockers, can't we? So um, is that your go-to? Is that your first line? So uh, you're quite right that uh, most treatment in POTS medications are used for symptom control. Uh, now, th there's two things that patients need to realize. The, the fact that because we don't have, we don't understand POTS, we can't cure it by with tablets. So you're not taking the medications for prognosis you're taking the medications to feel better. And therefore, patients should not be worried about trying medications out because if you feel better, you'll say, great. And if you don't feel better, you say, well, I don't want it. That's completely reasonable, right? Uh, but one of the things that helps people is to control their heart rate because it's so unsettling when they're standing up for a long period of time. In that sense, traditionally, beta blockers were the things that they used to be used. 
However, and they do work. We use propranolol, 10 milligrams, four times a day, something like that. But the problem with beta blockers is they lower their blood pressure. Patients already have low blood pressure. They make people feel tired. Patients are already tired. They make people feel cold. Patients are already cold. So I prefer using a drug called ivobradin. Ivobradin works purely by slowing the heart rate down. It doesn't have effects on the blood pressure, etc. Much better tolerated and seems to work much better. I started a dose of 2.5 milligrams twice a day, and then I gradually build up to 2.5 three times a day, and then even up to a maximum of five milligrams three times a day. Yeah, and um, so I would tend to reserve the beta blockers for people maybe who do have that high blood pressure associated um, with it. But sometimes, you know, it's a lot of trial and error, this, isn't it? So sometimes Absolutely. we start with one and switch. And Evabradine, so in terms of that um, dosing, um, we tend to say take it first thing in the morning and then probably like tea time rather than last thing at night. Yeah, I think so. Because one of the things that I have come across is most patients with POTS will say, that my heart rate goes inappropriately slow in the evenings when I'm sleeping. And how can I be comfortable that you're not going to push my heart rate too low? Uh, a couple of things. You're taking the medications in the morning when you're going to be upright. So ideally, first thing in the morning, even before you get out of bed, so that the medications are already working when you get out of bed, and then maybe some more at lunchtime. By the evening, the medication's out of your system and therefore it shouldn't have an impact on slowing your heart rate down excessively. The second thing is a low heart rate doesn't bother me. What bothers me is a symptomatic low heart rate, right? If the heart rate goes to 40 at night and it's just on your Fitbit, but you feel okay, I wouldn't be worried about that at all. It's just a number. The important thing is blood getting around and that you know because the patient gets symptoms. So if someone says, oh, that makes me feel very dizzy in the evenings, or I feel like I'm gonna pass out in the evenings and my heart rate is excessively slow, then I'd say, well, okay, well, just take it first thing in the morning, you know? And so you can have, you can play around. I mean, if you look in the BNF, I've brought in as a twice daily preparation. I use it three times daily without a problem, and I've done that for so long. So from my perspective, again, patients should have that license to adjust their doses and the timings of their doses as yep. best suits them, as long as they're not exceeding the maximum recommended doses. And um, should patients have an ECG? I mean, I, I think it's good practice for everyone to have a baseline ECG just to make sure that there's no um, changes. Is there anything we should be looking out for, any drug interactions, things like that? Yeah, so one of the drug interactions uh, to be aware of is that the ibuprofen in combination with some antidepressants can increase the QT interval. Uh, now, a lot of patients get given SNRIs as their antidepressant, and SNRIs produce, cause more adrenaline in the body. So they make POT symptoms worse, and they have an interaction with the ibuprofen. So wherever possible, I try and get them on an alternative agent and try and get them off the SNRI. So that would be something like duloxetine is an SNRI, oh, whereas your S SRIs, which is sertraline um, and yeah. uh, things like that, are, are a bit are a bit better. But I know that there can still be an interaction, so you just have to be a little bit careful. Um, but I think it's just good practice if you're on on these drugs, always check for drug interactions. You know, because there, there can always be unexpected side effects. But generally, it's pretty well tolerated without any major problems. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Okay. I've never had so we've got a question um, uh, here from uh, Louise Martin, who's just asked, is it, are beta blockers better than um, evabradine if you've got excessive adrenaline, or is it kind of the same principle supply? I think it's, I mean, in, in theory, beta blockers should work better because they blunt the effects of adrenaline, whereas ibuprofen is just controlling the heart rate. But in practice, I find that the ibuprofen mm -hmm. works better. You know, with Louise, I, I would suggest there's no harm in trying the beta blocker. Maybe you're the person it really works very well for. But if it doesn't work, don't be despondent. There is something else you can try out, like the ibuprofen. Absolutely. And so much of this is trial and error and individualized to, to the person and, and their Absolutely. symptoms. OK, so then that moves us on to another drug that we, we use quite a lot for these patients is something called midotrine. Um, which my, my very simplistic understanding is it's like the drug version of compression stockings. It kind of just helps to squeeze those lower limb 
blood vessels and push that column of of blood up so how 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 did what's your experience of using it and um do people tolerate it is it good for pots yeah i use ton, tons and tons of midodrin uh, because one of the things that people come back to me when they've tried the ibuprofen out is yes that slowed my heart rate down but everything else is the same i'm still fatigued i still have brain fog i still never wake up so even though my heart rate is better and thank you for that i'm no better so to speak so in those people you say well what next and this idea is uh, that midodrin as um, you very eloquently describe works a little bit like compression stock and you're pushing more blood you're making more blood available pushing it more of it up to the brain and that seems to work well as well um the combination of ibuprofen and midodrin works quite well um i use a dose of 2.5 mg 3 times a day it's generally best to avoid it within 4 hours of going to sleep now a lot of patients with pots get worried about it because they say well we're not allowed to lie down and we're always wanting to lie down because we feel so awful when we're standing up so how do i negotiate around that and my own feeling is it's okay to recline i can't see a problem with reclining it's just when you're completely fat and you you go down to you know you next you fall asleep then there is this risk of supine hypertension um but i've generally used it i've never really had a problem with it it does increase the blood pressure not hugely so but again it is a symptomatic treatment so i try the midodrin and some people come and say no that didn't work for me and some people come back and say that really works for me and that's how you learn so you say okay well if it didn't work for you stop it but for those people in whom it worked keep going yeah and it's it's super short acting isn't it so you have to take it a few times a day um, three times a day. and you know so some some of my patients will use it kind of they know they're going to be up and about that day or they've got to get through a morning of work and they're going to be upright but then they might not take it every day um some people take it twice a day some people take it three times a day I, is it just complete trial and error based on the person's symptoms that's the approach i have used you know the problem is uh, that'll never feature in a guideline you know so guidelines are always oh, you've got to do this and by this but i'm very much for the patient being allowed uh to do what works for them my role is to make medications available to the patient and then say look you know here are these things try and do try and see what works for you with these and most patients will come back and say something like well for me just taking it first thing in the morning works fine great you're not exceeding the maximum dose so i can't see how taking a little bit is doing you any harm and for some people they say you know i i take it three times a day and that works okay and then i say okay do you want to increase it let's try and increase it let's see whether you get even better when you increase it so again it's that kind of trial and error i would say midodrin is well is less well tolerated than ibuprofen i would say that the successes i get with midodrin are a lot less than with ibuprofen um and um but we started at a dose of 2.5 three times a day I don't think I have anyone who is at a dose of more than 10 three times a day. Yeah, so uh as as people are titrating it and and again this is kind of okay, I've tried the 2.5 it's not done very much. Um how do I titrate that up? How do I know if I'm taking too much? What what advice do you have around, you know, what that kind of self titration of the dose because people are a bit nervous about doing it particularly because you say oh well you know don't lie down for four hours before bed and it can make you feel poorly if you do that so from how from my how do we do it pragmatically from my perspective one thing i like to do is a 24 hour blood pressure monitor largely to reassure the patient that the blood pressure is not excessively high when they've been on their medications other than that it's all about side effects and what side effects that they get so a lot of people will say i get tingling and i didn't like that you know or i got bladder retention and i didn't like that and that's okay i mean if they've tried it and it doesn't work it doesn't work let's go on let's try something else yeah okay so that brings us um on to some of the other medications which are getting a bit more specialized so there's one called pyridostigmine or mestinon which i know you use quite a lot i've started using it um a bit more as well for for treatment of pots so this works in quite a different way doesn't it so pyridostigmine is a rest and digest enhancer as you may recall as you were saying 
there's too much flight and fight and too little rest and digest. So beta blockers, ibuprofen, it's a little bit like suppressing the flight and fight response, but pyridostigmine is trying to enhance the rest and digest response. So it's, uh, it's a very gentle agent, low side effect profile, and it makes people feel like their gut's starting to move. So their gut improves and they feel more rested. And for a lot of people, it's almost like a miracle drug. You know, they try it and they say, oh, that really, I love that. That makes me so much better. Because a lot of patients are chronically constipated. Uh, they're nauseous. They get bloated. Uh, so pyridostigmine works really well. And again, you can use it in addition to the ipoprad and the midodrine. I've never really had a major problem with it. The only thing you would want to be a little bit wary of is asthma. Uh, because it can make it can cause asthma flare-ups, but I've never really had that problem. Um, I started a dose of 30 milligrams twice a day. It can go up to 33 times a day and even up to 60 milligrams three times a day. And wherever I have the opportunity, I try and increase the dose because the majority of patients benefit from it. And I suppose the, the side effects people might expect are if, it, if the gut gets too active, it can cause yeah. some diarrheal side Diarrhea. effects. So to reduce the dose down bladder retention as well do you see that much with well, I haven't, I haven't, no not really no. Largely, no not so much no, so reasonably well tolerated and if it's not people yeah. know pretty quickly and can stop it um so fludrocortisone is one that i see being prescribed first line sometimes but particularly if people have so they don't necessarily have the pots but they have the um drop in the blood pressure when they stand so that's one that helps you retain salt and water through the kidneys but it's a bit more complicated in terms of monitoring and things do you use much fludrocortisone I do, but in my own experience, I've not had great success with fludrocortisone. You know, the successes I get are with ibuprofen, and metadrin, pyridostigmine. Those are the main three. Um, if patients are really struggling, they don't tolerate the metadrin, then I'd use fludrocortisone. I think because fludrocortisone is a mineralocorticoid, I, a lot of patients, a lot of doctors don't feel comfortable leaving patients, young patients, and fludrocortisone for a very long time. Um, so I would say I've only I only use it in a minority of patients. Some patients say, "Oh, it really works," but most patients, you know, don't. And you do have to keep an eye on kidney function and sodium and potassium levels with that, so it makes monitoring a little bit more tricky. Um, uh, very quickly, some of the other drugs like clonidine. Um, that's another one, yeah. a bit like mestinone, isn't it? Just triggers it, it's it's stimulating that parasympathetic. So, well, actually, I mean, clonidine is an antihypertensive, so we use low-dose clonidine, and it works in the, it's, it's a centrally acting sympatholytic, so it sort of works centrally to blunt the effects of adrenaline, um, okay. and it blunts the blood pressure as well. So where you truly have a patient with high blood pressure, and they've got this kind of flight and fight, I have used clonidine. And it seems to have helped patients. It's not as well tolerated as some of the other drugs. So low dose clonidine I've used. Another medication that really is very helpful and worth trying is low dose naltrexone, LDN. Yeah. Low dose naltrexone works very well. Uh, this is a opiate antagonist. It used, naltrexone used to be given to reverse the effects of opiates, but it has a hormetic effect, which means that a very low dose, it works very differently to the high dose. Low dose is it's an anti-inflammatory. It helps with pain, fatigue, and post-exertional malaise. And you start at 0.5 milligrams at night and then build up. And it, and it can actually be good for mast cell activation. So the people who get that, so they're sort of allergic side effects because it's anti-inflammatory. Um, lovely. And I, I've had a couple of patients, you've had really bad migraine, actually, with the long COVID. You have responded well to the low-dose clonidine Um so uh, uh, it was actually prescribed by a neurologist um, down in London. So that was quite interesting that it helped the POTS and the mm -hmm. headache. So bottom line is there's lots of things we can try, lots of um, trial and error. Now, I did, before we move on to questions, because I'm conscious of time, I did want to mention, um, so Louise Newson, who's um, a, a GP and very prominent uh, advocate for HRT and women's health, uh, was in touch. Um, and she very much wanted us to talk about POTS and hormones. Um, and she, she very kindly sent some, some really nice papers that I hadn't seen. 
Um, but uh, if I summarise these very quickly, um, there's there's a really nice review article that shows that POTS um, is was found to be much worse in the early part of the menstrual cycle, and it was associated with lower levels of hormones that are involved in retaining salt and water. Um, and that actually estrogen and progesterone can help with that. Some really interesting stuff about testosterone. So testosterone, which I didn't know, is actually a vasoconstrictor. So it, it helps squeeze the, the blood vessels. And it might be one of the reasons why women um, and, or teenage girls in particular are more likely to have POTS in the first place. Um, and and they also have found um, there's a research paper that shows total testosterone levels fall progressively during the menstrual cycle. So that might explain why some women get much like worsening of symptoms around their periods. Really interesting, very tiny study looking at three patients who, had, um, who were transgender and had transitioned from female to male. And this describes a little case series which showed that all of those three patients who had POTS um, their clinical symptoms improved with testosterone. So uh, I've had huge um, success with uh, women prescribing HRT generally for long COVID. And Louise is a big advocate of that as well. And we talk about using um, body identical formulations. So they're much more natural. They are um, uh, they don't have the same side effects, blood clotting risks as the synthetic hormones, very easy to be you know, patches, creams, they come in lots of different formats. And testosterone cream as well for women can help. And you know, it's very hard to get these things on the NHS. Um, but I promised Louise we'd talk about it. I don't know if this is something you, you have much knowledge on um, or something that women talk about. Absolutely. Well, it's very uh, obvious that virtually all POTS patients will say that they're worse when they're during their periods. So yeah. they, their symptoms really flare up. And it's also very obvious that a lot of POTS comes up in teenage years when hormones are, there's lots of hormonal fluctuations, etc. Uh, where we have seen this and we have recommended suppressing the periods, patients have generally felt that they feel a lot better. So yeah. there's no doubt that there is some um, credence to that. I don't know enough to be able to give you an informed opinion about testosterone, et cetera. But I think it's certainly a area definitely worth investigating a bit more. Yeah, worth saying that testosterone in the UK at the moment is not licensed for women, but it is going through some sort of MHRA approval, I think, as we speak. Um, so that it's very hard to get it outside of the private sector, which and it's quite expensive to buy. So it does limit, unfortunately, access to something which might really help um, for more than just um, uh, pots. But I'm going to move on to questions now. So um, there's a question here from Catherine um, who has asked, can teenagers be prescribed the drugs mentioned? Because, of course, pot, uh, pots can strike teenagers just purely because they have growth spurts and their heads get further away from their feet. Absolutely. So, um, yes, is the answer, a resounding yes. Uh, I don't think that we have to be so rigid about, oh, when is a teenager an adult and when are they a child? As long as they're grown up, as long as their body weight, their height is sort of uh, almost adult size, I'm more than happy just going for it. And even with certainly with Ivor Brad and I've been on some pediatric conferences and they've had really good results. So yeah, age doesn't, you know, unless they're really small. So if someone was like 10, I'd be very reluctant to give the medications without having a pediatrician to support me. Uh, but uh, if they're 13, 14, uh, then I have found that giving those medications and talking to the parents and knowing that, look, you know, a lot of times these guys, parents come to me and say, our child hasn't been to school for two years, you know? And what damage is that doing to the poor child because he's missing out on really important aspects of formative years of his life. So I've always been very willing to just step out of outside my own comfort zone and say, okay, let's just try this. And I have now accrued a large number of patients who are teenagers, who are young, who have tried the medications and actually seem to benefit more than adults, you know, they really benefit. Um, so yeah, all for it. 
Yeah, and as you know, I'm working with a um, paediatric cardiologist and, you know, the evabradine is extremely well tolerated amongst uh, the children and it can be absolutely life transforming. As you say, just fluid salt evabradine um, can get them back to school when they've been off. It's, it's, it's so simple. Um, but as you say, it's not licensed for children. So actually getting anyone to prescribe it is really difficult. Um, now, um, I'm going to just bring this question up. So I think it's a good question. So Louisa said in, in her experience, cardiology aren't interested in autonomic nervous system issues unless there's a positive tilt test. Neurology say they don't deal with it at all. And so I think this is right. People get stuck between um, cardiology and neurology. And actually cardiology go, well, it's not the heart. And neurology go, well, you know, there's nothing much we can do. And it, it's, it's kind of a blood vessel in general um, nerve signaling problem, isn't it? So there's just this hole that people fall into. And so the, the, the question is, how do we get help? And I, I don't have a brilliant answer. I think there's a lot more education that needs to happen, isn't there? I think so. And I think and this is why what you're doing is empowering patients with information. And actually, most GPs, you know, when I come across, their understanding is incredibly limited. Uh, but sometimes what happens is people think, OK, I know what this is because I've read a guideline in an outdated textbook or I've read a protocol or something like that in an outdated textbook. And if that patient doesn't comply with that, doesn't fit in that box, then they don't have it. We have to stop being, as a medical profession, we have to start being patient-centered, not specialty-centered, not organ-centered, not condition-centered, not data centered, we have to be patient centered. You listen to the patient and you treat that patient. You treat them as an individual. And the most important thing is we have to also somehow learn that we need to be more humble. You know, we don't know everything. It is only when you start faced with conditions like COVID and long COVID that we're beginning to realize there's so much that we don't know. So it is a mistake when medical professionals say, well, if I don't know it, you must be mad. And that is wrong. You know, it is, and this is the attitude that uh, uh, doctors have these days. If I don't know it, that's okay. Let's still work together. You are still deserving of my empathy. You are still deserving of my encouragement. You are still deserving of me being willing to step outside of my comfort zone, asking someone else who may be helping. So personally, that's where a doctor should turn around and say, well, maybe I can't help you, but I know Dr. Kane might be able to help you. Let's see if we can get you in touch with her. That's what they should be doing. And, you know, I think that brings us nicely onto Karen's comment here about uh, there's a lot of POTS patients, particularly because, you know, people do end up in A&E, don't they? Um, because they pass out or they become very tachycardic and feel dizzy and, they're, you know, they're, they're worried and they turn up and they're, they're, they have an ECG and a troponin and a chest x-ray and they go, it's this is all anxiety. And my patients who, even my patients who have anxiety as a pre-existing condition will say, I know what anxiety feels like. I've got anxiety. This isn't anxiety. This is something completely Absolutely. different. But yeah, they get told it's anxiety. So it's just about empowering, as you said, people to challenge that in a in a way that um, it's hard, though, isn't it? Because this happens a lot. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things to say. One, uh, I, I mean, in a very simplistic way, I see anxiety as a mental overreaction, whereas in POTS or dysautonomia, you're actually getting a biochemical overreaction. Mm -hmm. So to the outsider, you behave like you're anxious, but actually you within yourself know that this wasn't your mind making something bigger than it is. It is actually an overreaction, a biochemical overreaction from all that adrenaline. The second thing is, regardless anxious people are deserving of help we shouldn't be turning around and saying oh just because you're anxious it doesn't matter and actually if we find that whatever we do makes them better then it's still worth doing and that's why i think that i don't approach a patient with the intention of oh, is it anxiety is it pot so all i approach them with is you know, I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I may be able to offer you some help. So whatever you say, let's try and work with that. I try them uh, on medications and many of them will come back and say, no, I feel really good. And some people come back and say, well, actually, you know, everything you've tried hasn't worked for me. And I say, well, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean you still don't have the condition. Maybe all the medications I have aren't good enough. But no one turns around to me and says, oh, I hate you because you tried to help me. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Arises, you know, the problem, I don't do them a disservice by trying things. Uh, often yeah. it's something that they really appreciate because they feel better. Or sometimes they appreciate it anyway because they say, well, at least someone's tried. At least someone's not just fogged me off. Okay, that's 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 really helpful, and it's 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 an approach we just should have towards all chronic illnesses, I think. And anyway, we could probably go on for a long time about that topic. Um, I, so we're really short of time, so um, I'm going to just flash this question up from Scylla, who who um, has asked if someone's got POTS and hypertension, they can't tolerate beta blocker. Would you still would you kind of do both, like treat the hypertension and then add in evaporidine? Um, how do we do this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult, isn't it? But the, the important thing is, again, I always see hypertension as not a number. I don't think, okay, your blood pressure is 160 over 100, you have hypertension. Uh, to my mind, the definition of high blood pressure is that blood pressure that's doing you harm. So I always go a little bit further and I say, am I just trying to treat a number? Am I, I Have I identified a harmful process and am I going to treat that? So when I see hypertension, I look for evidence of damage in the blood vessel. So I look for hypertensive retinopathy, hypertensive nephropathy, LVH. If you have all those things, then I think, okay, you have a process going on, I need to be careful here. But if they don't have all those, then I don't worry so much about the blood pressure. And I would just use something else like another rate limiting medication. Fortunately, there are other medications which lower the blood pressure and lower the heart rate. But ultimately what matters is what the patient comes back and says, do they feel better? Because that's where it all starts, right? You want to make them feel better. And the last thing I try and do is get entangled into complex numbers and oh gosh, this could happen, that could happen. Have I made them feel better? So uh, it just requires a little bit more thought, but uh, you can work your way through it. So calcium blockers will lower the heart rate and lower the blood pressure. Alternatively, you could use ibuprofen to lower the heart rate and low dose clonidine to lower the blood pressure. Yeah, that's really good advice. Uh, I, I kind of that's made me think actually how much we we treat numbers. Uh, you know, we should always treat the patient, not the numbers. Um, I'm going to put this one up because it's something I'm quite passionate about. So Paul has asked about um, ice baths, and I think just generally, so um, cold water dipping is something that I uh, have really got into over the last year. And we run a group um, in Manchester on a weekend where four people with long COVID come down, do some breath work, and then dip in in the cold. So it was five degrees last weekend, and it was glorious. Um, and quite a lot of the patients have pots. I think you do have to be a little bit careful that people are well enough to do it and it's supervised. Uh, so I do, uh, that group is run with a proper cold water instructor and first time people get in, we do it very, um, you know, in a supervised way. So uh, I, I personally think it's good because it's a vasoconstricting, um, you know, cold water will cause the blood vessels to constrict. That's why people often feel really poorly in the bath or in the shower. But um, I think it's a it's a it's a great thing, Paul. But just got to be done safely and carefully. Sanjay, anything to add before we move on? Yeah. No, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I'm all for empowering patients to try stuff. And physiologically, it makes sense. You know, when you they feel worse in heat, and they generally feel a little bit better in the cold. So, absolutely, uh, if there is access available, if there is a mechanism by which they can try it out then I'm always ready to encourage them to try it out. But, you know, you try it out. If it suddenly feels like the best thing ever, great, you found your solution, you know. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be about my pills. It's about empowering the patient and saying, you just go on your own adventure. And if something goes wrong, I'm going to be there standing beside you to support you. But let my thoughts not limit you in any way to try and get the help that you deserve. Yeah. Okay. So we are out of time, unfortunately, and there are quite a few other questions that came through, but we are at the hour and I really don't want to keep this any longer than an hour. So it just leaves me to say like a massive thank you, Sanjay. And I think if there's um, a lot of demand, maybe we can do a bit of a longer Q&A some other time in the future. So it's relatively straightforward to set up a session like this. So um if, if there was a lot of demand um, and, and if there are questions and we'll try and maybe um, answer those or put links in the in the show notes under the YouTube recording. So massive, massive thank you, A, for 
looking after all those patients who I, I know there's so many of them who've gone to you for help who haven't been able to get help um, anywhere else. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, and, uh, and and maybe we'll have you back at some some point uh, soon. Um, oh, so yeah, and, uh, and, and, and that's it for tonight. So I will be back. We're having a break over Christmas, but I will be back on um, the 3rd of January. Uh, my next guest is Mr. Toby Richards, who runs the Iron Clinic down in London. He's a vascular surgeon. And we are going to talk about all things iron and ferritin, which is a minefield, if I'm honest with you. And I'm really, really looking forward to that conversation. So have a lovely Christmas, everyone. And I will see you in the new year. Take care.